Okay, so um, hi again. I'm Tiffany Patton, a co-director at Roku Media and a member of the Oakland Food Policy Council, and I will be moderating tonight's event. Um, thank you for joining us for Food and Housing Justice in District 3, a forum for candidates for the Alameda County Board of Supervisors special election. Uh, so this forum is brought to you by the Alameda County Community Food Bank, Real Food Media, St. Mary's Center, and East Bay Housing Organizations. Each of the organizations are 501c3 nonprofits and do not specifically endorse any candidate for public office, including those present in this forum. Um, but we organize this candidate forum to highlight, the to highlight the interconnectedness of food and housing issues and just how vital food security and housing is to the thriving community. Uh, when thinking about food justice, I think we think about a lot of things, like is there enough to eat? Is it food nourishing? Is it culturally appropriate? Um, but physical safety is not often something that we think about uh, and it's almost assumed. And this past weekend, that assumption was you know, thrown in our face. Uh, everyone has the right to feel and to be safe and secure when getting food. And our hearts go out to those impacted by the terrible violence this past weekend in Buffalo and the ongoing violence we've all been witness to and or experienced. And while it may seem like food and housing justice might not protect us from physical violence, um, organizing for food and housing justice and voting are ways to protect ourselves and our communities from the structural and cultural violence that has been uh, baked into the foundation of this country. So um, the winner of this election will replace the current Alameda County Supervisor, Dave Brown, who replaced Supervisor Wilma Chan after her tragic passing last year. Wilma was a fierce advocate for affordable housing, as well as healthcare, childcare, immigrants' rights, and senior services. So we honor her and her service to all of Alameda County tonight. Now I want to welcome our D3 candidates, Serling Grant, Rebecca Kaplan, David Katsushiba, and Lena Tam. Thank you again so much for being here tonight. Um, before we start, I'm going to uh, explain some procedures for the forum. Um, each candidate will have 90 seconds for opening and closing statements and 90 seconds to answer questions unless otherwise noted. Um, we ask that you please respect the time limits and if you continue speaking after the time is up, I will gently interrupt you and move on to the next speaker. And if audience members have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And for questions we are unable to get to tonight, we'll be sharing those with candidates and we'll share their answers if they have the capacity to answer them with all registrants in a follow-up communication along with the recording. So for the opening statements, um, each person will have 90 seconds for the opening statement and we'd love to start with you. Uh, Serling Grant, if you could share your opening statement with us, that'd be great. And good evening all. I'm glad to be here for this forum. Um, so the county, as we know, serves everyone with the range of services from those with the least to people who are quite comfortable from free meal distribution to property tax collection. I'm running and I feel compelled to run to make sure that those with limited resources, the diverse and socioeconomically challenged presidents of our county have access to the bureaucracy, have transparency, and accountability for those in charge and the gatekeepers. There are two specific incidents that morally compelled me to run. One had to do with the healthcare system and San Leandro Hospital in particular, and one with an affordable housing development that is currently in foreclosure about the 100th day of its 90 day notice. In each case, people, they were not voiceless, they were just unheard. They didn't realize how to fight the system or get through the system. And I realized that this happens too much that without an advocate, people are rejected by the systems that are in place. My professional career is in housing, community development, transportation, and uh, collaborative policy making in those arenas. I am the, the shepherd of the city of San Leandro's 15% inclusionary housing requirement that still stands in place even though redevelopment has gone away. Thank you, I'll share more of my story I'm later. Thank you. And um, just a reminder also to myself that we uh, should talk a little more slowly um, so that our translators have the time to translate for us. So thank you so much for, for that statement. And also um, Jose and Joanna thank, you, Joanna, thank you so much for your patience. Um, okay, now next we have David Kakishiba. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, meet this evening. My name is David Kakisiba, running for Alameda County Supervisor District 3. 
Uh, I am running uh, because I believe Alameda County, county government uh, can and must do uh, much better uh, for the, the people uh, living uh, in uh, District 3. Uh, homelessness, uh, crime and violence uh, are all on the rise. Uh, I think we uh, all want to see uh, real solutions and get real results uh, to seeing fewer people on the streets, actually no people living on the streets and having to uh, uh, get by under those kinds of conditions. Uh, and uh, we just have to do a lot better. I have worked for the last 42 years as the executive director of the East Bay Asian Youth Center, a nonprofit youth development organization based in Oakland. Uh, we work with 2,500 young people, including many young people directly involved in the juvenile and criminal justice systems. Uh, I served 12 years on the Oakland Unified School District Board of Education and five of those 12 years as board president. Thank you very much. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, and next we have Rebecca Kaplan. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you so much for having us here to talk about how we can work together to build a stronger and healthier future for our community. I would be honored to serve as your county supervisor to make sure that we attain these vital goals, affordable housing for everyone in our community and food that is healthy and available and accessible. I currently have the honor to serve as the Oakland City Council Member at large and vice mayor. And before that, I served on the board of AC Transit representing the whole district, including all of the communities that are part of County Supervisor District 3. I served on the board of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, winning millions of dollars for zero emission trucks and other technology to cut air pollution that is so harmful and so concentrated on our communities. I serve our county on the Alameda County Transportation Commission where I changed policy so that we could use countywide transportation funds to fund meal delivery, including programs like Meals on Wheels to get food to those who need it. I believe in public land for public good and food hubs for every neighborhood. Time. I'm very honored to be your supervisor. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, for the last opening statement, Lena Tam. Thank you for inviting me to this forum. I am Lena Tam. I had served on the Alameda City Council as the first Asian woman vice mayor. I'm running for the Alameda County Board of Supervisors with a very great sense of responsibility and determination to improve county services for working families and also help serve as a voice for a large and growing immigrant population, similar to the role that the late Wilma Chan had. I plan to address the issues of housing, community safety, and health care, particularly mental health care access, and bring my lived experience as a daughter of immigrant parents who relied on county bilingual health care as your next supervisor. I live and I grew up in Alameda going through the public school system here, graduated from UC Berkeley in environmental engineering. I work in Oakland Chinatown for the last 30 years at the East Bay Mud Building. I have a proven track record of collaborating and giving a voice to our multicultural community in working through issues like affordable housing. When I was vice mayor of Alameda, we built low income housing for seniors, veterans, and secured funding for a new boys and girls club. When I was president of the Alameda Healthcare District that governed Alameda Hospital, I worked to consolidate women's health services to provide safe reproductive choices and care. When I chaired the Alameda County Planning Commission, we entitled 2,400 housing units. Time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. So our first question is about the social safety net. So how does the county's social safety net need to be structured as well as, as administered in order to ensure an equitable recovery from the ongoing pandemic? 
And what is your strategy if elected as the third district supervisor in leading that effort? So um, first we'd like to hear from, from David, please. Um, let's see. So uh, uh, I, I think the first thing is, is that the, uh, the pandemic in, in terms of the uh, outcomes uh, as the pandemic was uh, ramping up uh, and, and it's the uh, ongoing kind of uh, spikes that were going on, we saw the data was very clear, uh, both the quantitative data, data as well as the lived stories and testimonies is that the impacts were uh, uh, hardest hit in communities that uh, can clearly be identified both by race, uh, by language access, uh, and by money, uh, and by zip codes. And that the, uh, uh, and any comprehensive systematic effort for recovery, a county-led effort around recovery, uh, has to start, that's a starting point, is examining where the impacts are disparate and building the resources and the infrastructure uh, in those communities, in those neighborhoods, uh, to be able to reach uh, uh, people uh, in those communities with the kinds of supports and the kinds of relationships uh, that will help to uh, help them uplift themselves. Thank you so much, David. Now, Rebecca, your answer for that question. Thank you. Our social safety net needs to be clearer to the applicants and easier to apply for. Right now, the county is facing a crisis around rental assistance not getting to tenants in need who are now in fear of eviction. In homeless services, People are faced with eight different things to click online and no clarity about which one to fill out. We have people looking for CalWORKs or general assistance and then being told they need a computer to get access to what they need when they don't have that. I would work to significantly expand workforce development with paid job training in fields like healthcare, mental health and other essential workers, including bus drivers that our community has a shortage of and pay people to get trained in these roles to then have jobs serving our community in vital needs. I bring to this experience the work having launched the nation's first FEMA backed large vaccination site for COVID vaccine at the Oakland Coliseum and working with the city, the county, the state, and the federal government to then also launch vans into neighborhoods that were being underserved to bring the vaccine directly through strategies like church parking lots. We need to bring that integrated approach throughout our services. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, now, Lena, on to you. Um, so it's clear that the pandemic has really exacerbated the severe and the pervasive health and social inequities that we're seeing in our county, where essential workers uh, who are made up primarily of people of color have a higher likelihood of exposure. I think it's going to be very important to implement uh, what has been put in place on a nationwide basis, like the presidential task force, where they put forth recommendations uh, six months or seven months ago that would allocate resources using an equity lens, uh, requiring uh, that we include people that are directly affected, uh, making sure that those from the communities who have been left behind, that they have more of a voice in recommending how we uh, equitably recover from the pandemic and making sure that it includes our healthcare providers, our neighborhood clinics, our mental health professionals, I want to lead that effort to bring all those groups together and also deal with uh, a system that has data collection that is on a timely basis where we can get that information quickly, also invest in our public health care workforce and making sure that we administratively have uh, metrics to determine the, that we are meeting the health equity um, 
goals that we have set forth with these uh, recovery programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Serlene? Yes, thank you. So our recovery coming out of the pandemic, the pandemic illustrated, highlighted the inequity so much in our communities throughout the county. And uh, to fix that, we really need good data. And Oakland has a model disparity study for Oakland. Right now, the South County communities, uh, unincorporated communities of San Lorenzo, Ashland, Cherryland, Castro Valley, and Hayward Acres, part of, part of this district, are undergoing- I just wanna remind you to please talk a little bit more slowly. Are, I'm so sorry, are undergoing the environmental justice element update for the county to give us more data for the South County. So we'll have a broader look at what services and what's missing. And then I believe it's on the board of supervisors to make sure people have access and to get through the gatekeeping of our own bureaucracy. Make sure that we are bringing programs and services once we've identified who's not getting the services, which are mostly going to be black and brown folks, that we are culturally relevant in our development and our services that we're bringing, and that we bring service providers to the table collaboratively to help us develop and create services that will help close the gaps, that will help provide, provide services. I'll just stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so for our next question, um, I want to talk about uh, all in eats. So uh, as we know, Wilma Chan was a champion for, for food justice in Alameda County. And in 2020, her office in partnership with community-based organizations and the Alameda County De Deputy Sheriff's Activities League, they launched all in eats, an effort to work towards a healthy, nourished county benefiting from a local sovereign food economy with a wide range of programs like procurement policies, promoting regenerative agriculture, um, using food as medicine, and creating a circular food economy. All of these things, all of which supports the health and dignity of farmers, eaters, and our environment. So how does All in Eats fit into your broader social justice strategy, and what are your plans to continue it if elected? Uh, Rebecca, I want to start with you. Well, thank you. And I'm incredibly grateful to this question because supporting, strengthening, and expanding All in Eats is absolutely core to my commitment and to my vision as county supervisor. I am thankful to Supervisor Wilma Chan for her incredible leadership on this. And we have worked collaboratively on healthy food access for many years, including that I co-authored the Soda Tax in Oakland, which funds healthy food interventions. We need to support programs like Dig Deep Farms and the Food Hub, which currently serves the unincorporated area with commercial kitchens so that community members can make money in the food sector while providing healthy food in the community. We need food hubs throughout the county. I will work to expand them and to add delivery so that residents can get healthy food delivered from the food hubs and our local providers make the money instead of it going to some out of state corporation. We know that healthy food heals lives and reduces disease and so many of our communities lack that. That's why we fought for the Healthy Food Conversion Program and why I will work to expand All In Eats. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, Lena? Uh, Supervisor Dave Brown and I have met and we he's been very supportive of my campaign to succeed uh, Supervisor Wilma Chan and has connected me with several of the staff that is working on Wilma Chan's broader social justice program like All In Eats in order to break that cycle of poverty, poor health and lack of economic opportunity. And prior to that, I had already been supporting organizations like Daily Bowl that helps recover excess food that would otherwise go to waste and deliver it to Bay Area agencies that feed families who are hungry. This was integral to my role when I was on Stop Waste to reduce waste going into our landfill. 
And so one of the most impressive staff that I uh, met with was the executive director of All In, Larissa Estes White. And uh, I definitely plan on continuing Wilma Chan's legacy to end poverty as this broader social justice strategy with All In Eats, uh, promoting the circular economy, growing food at community centers, making sure working with Dr. Chan on, make, on having food as medicine and giving formerly incarcerated individuals uh, job opportunities like trucking and food delivery. And this uh, administratively is at the board of supervisors level. Uh, right now it's uh, being, and second. this committee has been chaired by Supervisor Brown and Supervisor Miley. And I would expect to continue that and have that broad approach. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sterling, can you tell us about your All In Eats plan? Yes, I actually, everything I know about the, the All In plan, um, I love for all the points that have already been brought out. Uh, but also we need to look at food security that comes with this program, just like housing security translates into a public safety issue or public safety benefit. If people are, can get food, if people can get housing, that in so many ways diminishes the threat of crime in our community. And so I like it also, not only because it gives people the basic need of finding a food source and identifying a food source in their community, but it, it has a, 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 far, a further reaching effect. In addition, I think that the program is recognized more for being a central county program. And I think we need to make it scalable. In San Leandro, we have a program called April Showers that was very much grassroots in its, organ in its inception, just like um, Wilma Chan's program, bringing in the grassroots organization. So I think we need to scale it to other communities. We have oh, um, empty storefronts that could be food distribution centers. Uh, we need to be able to make food available. There's a, uh, a site that's on the, there's a site on the county website that uh, that's supposed to help us identify food distribution places. I plugged in my own zip code in San Leandro, and nothing Fine. showed up. Thank you, Sarlene. Um, and now, David, can you tell us about your all, your plans around All In Eats and how it fits into your broader social justice strategy? Um, so uh, the, the, the whole concept and the aspirations is, is right on. Uh, I, uh, it, however, it, it will not be in my top three uh, uh, priorities. I want to be involved and uh, I want my office to be involved, to support, to strategize. Uh, but it would not be in my top three. My top three will be uh, addressing homelessness, addressing violence, and expanding children's services. Uh, having said that, uh, I've had uh, direct experience. We did uh, over a three-year period establishing a network of 25 weekly uh, produce stands at 22 or 25 different elementary schools in Oakland Unified School District. And it got to a place where the uh, spending capacity was close to $200,000 each week uh, on those produce stands. And we worked for uh, uh, two, three years in, in building that and then transitioning it to the Oakland Unified School District Food Services to maintain. And within about a year and a half, uh, it fell apart. Uh, and so the, the I know firsthand that the task of building a full circle foods economy seconds. is an enormous task. Uh, and I have some opinions about it. Uh, and I'd like to be, I want to be really helpful. Fine. Got it. Thank you. I want to be really helpful, but it's not in your top three of your priorities, which the priorities are violence, homelessness, and youth services. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit from food and talk about housing. Uh, this is a two-part question, so you'll have two and a half minutes to answer. Um, okay, so Measure A1 was an affordable housing bond that passed in 2016 by 73%, raising $580 million for the construction of affordable homes. So with all of the funds now allocated, would you support another affordable housing bond, housing bond measure in Alameda County? 
So that's part one. And then part two is, um, and while a new bond can help with housing production, more also needs to be done for tenants. Uh, as we know, municipal and housing services in unincorporated areas like San Lorenzo are provided by the county. So what would you, what would you do to stabilize rents and keep people housed in Alameda County, especially for the 60,000 renters in the unincorporated areas? Um, so uh, Lena Tam, if you could answer this question first. So yeah, what would you, um, would you support another affordable housing bond measure? And what will you do to stabilize rents and keep people housed in Alameda County? So providing housing for the homeless um, is one of my top priorities, and it continues to be a very high priority for uh, not only our county, but the state and the region. So in addition to measure A1, there are other measures that uh, have not been fully uh, utilized, and that, for example, is like measure W, and that would generate about $150 million each year to fund affordable housing, mental health support, and job training. I think with Measure W, uh, Alameda County now uh, has one of the highest tax rates and tax, uh, excuse me, sales tax rates, and that tends to be fairly regressive. So I think we need to consider funding sources from the federal government and the state that we need to leverage, including rental assistance programs. So I will work to eliminate the delays and help process the emergency rental assistance program funding including providing any bridge funding through uh, county funds because of the delays. But with a $100 billion budget surplus at the state level, I think the state is committed and um, the county of Alameda and the city of Oakland are going to be getting very significant resources uh, to invest in uh, providing affordable housing. And that is going to be something that we need to tap into with respect to um, rent stabilization, I know that last year uh, with funding from the San, San Francisco Foundation, the county had already started conversations within the unincorporated areas with the community groups like the Eden Renters Union around uh, the housing issues and, and rent stabilization. So I think it's important to have an understanding from the communities that are in the unincorporated area that know best what they need because uh, the 140,000 people in the unincorporated area are not a monolith. I think it was clear that both landlords and tenants are facing challenges when it comes to getting rent payments and they both want to keep families and tenants housed. So I think there needs to be a more effective way to resolve the disputes between tenants and landlords, including providing you know, legal aid to renters, making sure there's arbitration programs, making sure there's um, a rent board that helps landlords and renters Time. resolve issues and enforce AB 1482. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next we have Serlene. Thank you. So yes, I would support an, uh, a re-up, re if you will, of the bond measure. I think we have seen its success as each city uh, in the county and the unincorporated area has had its share of um, money come from it. And when combined with other resources um, has made a dent in several of the cities. Some cities still have a little bit of funding to spend, but it's working. And I think that um, uh, when we talk about how to uh, stabilize rents and keep people, I, I believe that now with the state's rent control and the um, just cause evictions and uh, AB 1482 laws, that we have help in our communities to ensure that people have some protections. But I think with the County of Alameda, we need to make sure there is a body uh, uh, as Lena said, a re review board, or somebody to make sure that these, these protections are indeed in place, monitored and implemented. I, I'm concerned that they may not be. Um, I also think that we should have programming to close the gap in rent. Um, in other forms, I've kind of been par uh, comparing it with something like universal basic income. But we will find that when the moratorium is lifted, there will be people who will be $200, $300 short 
of making their rent payment and taking care of other things. We need to be able to cover that on the front end so that it doesn't cost us on the back end. I recently heard that there is such a pilot being planned in the county now. I was trying to find it on our very complicated website. I did not find it. I'd like to think that since I've been talking about it since January, somebody lifted it, but I will go with great minds think alike. And I'm glad that the county is looking at something like this, if it's true, so that when we get when we are sitting as a board of supervisors, we can make sure that people are indeed housed. Um, I'd also like to work closely with communities that are challenged so that we can have classes in financial literacy, uh, home buying, incentives, um, other things to help people stay solid and whole and housing seconds. secure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next we would love to hear from David. Uh, in general, yes, I, I do support a re-upping of uh, Measure A1. Uh, I do uh, also want to see that the city of Oakland is uh, investing. Uh, there's a potential of, of uh, that the city may put a bond measure, an extension of the current uh, Measure KK. Uh, back when Measure KK was initially uh, introduced by the uh, by uh, Mayor Saf. Uh, from from the co from a community standpoint, we argued strongly for a significant uh, share of affordable housing being allocated to that bond, uh, and ultimately a hundred million dollars uh, was out of a seven hundred million dollar bond. Uh, and so, it, it, when you have something like the Home Together Plan and you're looking at billions of dollars over a short period of time that marshalling all the resources, the county has a, a contribution, the, the local cities have a contribution, anything that can be drawn down from the state surplus uh, is, is, in fact, the entire thing should be funded by the state, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, we know that that's not going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and a dedication of the county's uh, reserve fund uh, to establish an ongoing housing, affordable housing trust fund uh, at the county level is uh, key. Do, do I still so have much. time? Yeah, Ruby, how much time do we have? Okay, and then in terms yeah, of- so that, Oh, you still have time. Okay. In terms of the uh, tenant protections, particularly in the unincorporated areas, uh, I agree with uh, uh, what everybody has already uh, indicated. I, I think the, the uh, concept of having a public body uh, overseeing uh, tenant protections, uh, uh, whether it's uh, in terms of, uh, inter uh, whether, uh, uh, whether it's rent control, just cause eviction. Uh, 10 seconds. Okay. okay, thank you so much, David. And then um, now Rebecca. Thank you so much. It's important to acknowledge that we have a dire shortage of affordable housing in our community. And this is devastating people's lives. People are being evicted and displaced. Many are becoming homeless. Some are driving four hours a day back from the far place they got displaced to. Others are struggling and sleeping on couches of friends and relatives. We need to build significantly more affordable housing that is specifically committed to being affordable and we need to protect tenants from displacement to stop this spiral. There is a danger that we could face a wave of evictions in the coming months because of the failure to give out the emergency rent assistance and the great difficulty that applicants are being put through. In Oakland, I fought for us to pass and we did bridge loan funding so that we can give out more rent assistance funding while waiting for the next round to come. The county needs to do that too. 
they are wasting time making applicants compete against each other when there should be enough money to fund them all to prevent people from suffering and being evicted. I support rent stabilization. Before I was elected official, I worked as a tenant's attorney in Oakland and helped pass just cause for eviction as a ballot measure in Oakland. I've also worked to provide funding for tenant legal services because rights don't get enforced if people don't have that support. We need to use public land for public good, including building affordable housing on public land, and the county owns a lot of it. The county also every year seizes hundreds of houses and sells them at auction to investors from out of state. Those could be used to create affordable housing in our community. And, and yes, I support both a new bond issuance and using other strategies like money in Oakland's KK and using Time. infrastructure financing. Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of the forum. Uh, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or put questions into the audience Q&A box on the Zoom screen. Um, but first, uh, we have a few questions from members from the sponsoring organizations. Uh, so first up, we have a question from Jesse at, from St. Mary's Center. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much, Jesse. Okay, great. Um, my name is Jesse Williams. I'm uh, representing St. Mary's Center here in Oakland. And um, I have a question. Um, how would you meaningfully work alongside advocates, you know, people with uh, actual lived experience of homelessness? How will you work toward drafting solutions on housing? And what is your plan to support the implement implementation of the Home Together 2026 Community Plan? Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. And just a reminder, it's back to 90 second responses uh, for each of these questions. Um, Serlene, would you like to go first? You're muted. Yes, okay, I'll be glad to go first. Um, as I spoke earlier, my one of my reasons for running was the fact that there was a group of people that I was working with who suddenly found themselves with the threat of being homeless. I think one of the ways to work with people um, is to bring them into developing the solution. For this particular situation, I brought the um, housing specialist developer, if you will, the property owner. This, the foreclosure notice was coming from the state. I brought the residents and I brought the property management and the county all together to come up with a solution. We're waiting to see if our solution is acceptable we're on day 100. So I think that when we look at how we address homelessness, we have to look at making sure we talk to the people who are living that. Again, some people are homeless because they couldn't make ends meet. Some people are homeless because of family situations. And some people are homeless because of mental health reasons. And the solutions to all of them are different. And we have to consult with them and collaborate with them to find out what we need to do. The um, Home Together plan, the community plan to address homelessness is an excellent plan. And again, uh, the short version of that is that everyone comes together. We need to break sure that we bring the cities, the regional and state agencies together, as it says, home together, Hi. the funders and the people who are suffering from it together for solutions. Thank you so much, Serene. And so, um... Um, yeah, David, if you'd like to answer this question. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I, I am committed. I think I have a long history of engaging those who are most impacted uh, to help to develop uh, and to be leaders in the development of, uh, of public policy. Uh, and around uh, public accountability 
uh, for getting things done from the ideas, from the tables, uh, from the closed door meetings to actually seeing real life positive impact uh, on those uh, that are in need. Uh, so I, I am committed to that uh, and uh, it will be a 360 uh, a degree engagement uh, of folks uh, most impacted uh, by the um, uh, um, not being able to, uh, uh, to be housed. Uh, in terms of the Home Together plan, it, it is an ambitious uh, framework. Uh, it, uh, there's uh, not a lot there. Well, I, I have not read the extensive full report, uh, but clearly it requires uh, the, uh, not just the cooperation, but the discipline of- One second. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the next up, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Yes, I am fully committed to working together on this vital change that is needed. And that includes listening to those who have the direct experience. And that's part of why I have fought, for example, to remove barriers to entry that you can't tell someone they have to not have a partner, not have a pet, um, not have anything going on in their lives if they're going to get support. We also need to dramatically expand the number of affordable housing units as the report recognizes to meet the needs. And that is why we need to fight for another bond measure and to use enhanced infrastructure financing, which is another way of leveraging money that the state now allows again. It used to be called redevelopment, then they got rid of it, then homelessness exploded. Now the state has authorized a new method to build affordable housing and we need to build a lot of it. We also need to buy existing dorms and hotels so we can very quickly have places with a lot of rooms where people can get a space off the street immediately in a building that can also have staff and services. And we need to use public land for public good with a focus on affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, uh, Lena Tam. Thank you. I had uh, the opportunity to meet with uh, several of the navigation centers or community impact hubs that have a really good track record of taking this whole person approach to addressing homelessness and employing a no wrong door response to people in need. But most of the funding that the county receives require direct participation by those with lived experiences. For example, last year, as part of the All In program, the county received a $6.6 .6 million grant from the federal government for youth homelessness programs. And this grant requires that the youth take an active role in deciding how the money will be used. Their input was key in prioritizing funding for new transitional housing, as well as new navigation services to help them through processes of applying for jobs, schools, and, and what, whatnot. Um, the Home Together 2026 uh, Community Plan, which was endorsed by the supervisors this week, uh, I. I fully want to implement that. I want to expand the network of agencies that includes these kind of community-based organizations with access to rapid pathways to housing and critical support services, particularly when people transition to permanent housing. I want to focus on preventing homelessness by working with county agencies that manage our hospitals, our jails, our foster care to avoid homelessness. Time. And I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you so much. So our next question um, from a member from a supporting or sponsoring organization is going to be from Allison Chan. So Allison, if you could please ask your question. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Yes, great. My name is Allison Chen. I'm a student at Oakland High. I'm also a youth organizer with Oakland Kids First. 
And in 2020, Oakland voters passed Measure QQ, which enfranchised 16 and 17 year olds to vote in school board elections. And in 2016, Berkeley voters passed a similar measure. Both have yet to be implemented. OUSD hired two consultants to work in partnership with the Alameda County Registrar of Voters to successfully develop the systems that will allow eligible 16 and 17 year olds to vote. However, it has recently come to our attention that the registrar is impending the implementation plan. I know you wouldn't take office until January, but in the meantime, what can we count on you to do to ensure the registrar's office solidifies youth voting systems in advance of the November 2022 school board election? Great. Thank you so much for that question, Allison. Um, David, if you could, if you could kick us off of answering that question. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, it, it is something that I shared with uh, your executive director, uh, Lucas Brucky Meisner. Uh, Dave Brown has to deliver. Uh, this is much of this is uh, and and Keith Carson and Nate Miley. Uh, this is Oakland. Uh, and the people of Oakland uh, passed that measure two years ago, and it, it's, uh, you've allowed for enough time to ramp up, uh, and it just needs to get done. And so I believe that the uh, three supervisors uh, should be uh, directly involved, uh, and any conversations that I can have with uh, uh, the three of them uh, in conjunction with Oakland Kids First and all the other hundreds of young people uh, that uh, campaign for that uh, and are working on it right now, uh, I will do so. Uh, but the, clearly the target is our, our three county supervisors that represent Oakland. Nice, thank you so much, David. Um, and next, uh, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And thank you for reminding everyone about the incredible importance of this ballot measure, which was an idea that came from our young activists who then asked me to turn it into a resolution at the Oakland City Council. And so I was honored to author that resolution that the council passed to create the ballot measure to allow our young people to vote in local school board elections. And we campaigned for it and it passed. And it also passed in Berkeley and then the next step was money to implement it. Berkeley didn't put in money, but I got Oakland to agree that we would fund implementation. So then you had the voters said yes, the city council said yes, we put in the money. And then because elections throughout the whole county are run not by each city, they're run by the Alameda County Registrar of Voters, they have to do a software upgrade to add the capability to include 16 and 17 year olds in school board elections, and they haven't done it yet. And every single county supervisor needs to be part of that solution because the voters approve this and they need to have the right to vote. And so that is part of what inspired me to run for county supervisor is so we can implement things that are needed like youth voting through the county registrar. Thank you so much. And uh, Lena. I wholeheartedly agree uh, with what the others have said. I support the measure. I think uh, it's very important that you take an active role, particularly when it, it affects uh, their lived experience of, uh, of the school district. I also agree that um, the county registrar of, of voters need to uh, speed up and also uh, that might involve a conversation if they haven't already done so uh, between the three supervisors, including District 3, uh, that would be covering Oakland to make sure that this gets expedited and that uh, this measure is implemented. I think um, the issues that the Register of Voters have had, uh, have they've had for uh, the last couple years and uh, I don't understand whether it's a funding issue or whether it's a staffing issue or whether or not there's things that uh, we can do uh, to move things forward. But I would certainly commit to 
helping uh, make sure that that measure gets implemented. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks, to the questioner, you, you don't know me, but I would love to follow up with you because this is the kind of thing that actually motivates me to want to be in office because these are the kinds of things that stop people. These are the kinds of things that, you know, like how, how do you get access? How do you get, how do you get what you're entitled to, what your rights are? If you, if, if the whole community the, voted on something and you still can't get it. So I don't know all the background. I don't know what the supervisors have done, but if the supervisors have not stepped up um, and done what they should have, we need to hold them accountable. For me personally, I would start by writing a letter to those the uh, registrar voter and the secretary of state demanding that you all get after two years what was asked for. And if, the, and if what uh, council member Rebecca has said is not, has not happened that the software, well, well why not? Is there, is there not software available? Then let you know. Um, so it's, this is about voter rights. This is about young people being stopped in their tracks. There's just so much that is so wrong that this is the kind of thing that absolutely motivates me. Thank you so much, Serene. It's great to hear the excitement and passion. Um, we have one more question from um, a member of the sponsoring organization, and then we're gonna open it up to audience Q&A. So if you do have a question, um, please raise your hand and we will get to it after this last question. Um, and the final question is from Juliana from My Eden Voice. Buenas noches a los candidatos. Me llamo Juliana Weiss León y estoy aquí representando a My Eden Voice, una organización que está buscando crear poder en la comunidad de las áreas no incorporadas. Mi pregunta es, eh, las comunidades no incorporadas han estado preocupadas durante mucho tiempo por la representación cívica dada la naturaleza de no estar incorporadas. ¿Qué pasos tomaría para abordar las preocupaciones locales sobre la falta de equidad y transparencia para las comunidades no incorporadas? Gracias. Thank you so much. So uh, again, the question is, uh, what steps would you take to address local concerns about the lack of equity and transparency in unincorporated communities? Uh, Rebecca, we'd like to start with you. Thank you. I would be very honored to represent all of District 3, including the unincorporated areas. And I recognize that I or anyone who holds this seat owes a specific duty to the unincorporated areas because we would be both your county government and basically also your city government because for the unincorporated area, the supervisors control the functions that are normally under a city. And so for example, I believe we need to schedule separate county budget hearings that are held in the unincorporated areas when we are debating about the funding for the aspects of the unincorporated areas that in a city would be handled by a city council. We need to take seriously our duty. And as someone who has represented a city, I would bring that knowledge to making sure the unincorporated area gets that service too, gets that funding also. They were even underserved in COVID vaccinations. And because sometimes the unincorporated areas don't have city government to fight for them, that means that those of us who would, might That's be at the county have to do that job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Lena, if you can go ahead and answer that question. Uh, so the city uh, usually have their own, uh, or excuse me, the unincorporated areas have their uh, a, a newly established municipal services um, agency that uh, provide, or advisory group that provides significant information uh, to the board of supervisors, but the board of supervisors serve as 
the, uh, your council member and we will deal with all issues from public works, from equity, which is normally not what most, most cities deal with. So I plan on making sure I use the experience I gain as a city council member to provide those kind of municipal services for the unincorporated area. Um, I know that recently the Municipal Services Advisory Council did uh, have an information item that uh, commissioned a study from LAFCO, the local area formation agency, to look at the financial feasibility of incorporation of all the incorporated areas, unincorporated areas. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see what those studies say, but more importantly, the people that are in the unincorporated area need to have a voice in second. that process. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Serling? Yes, so as been said, the Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. serve as the government representatives for the people of the unincorporated area. The MAC serves as an advisory board to them. But unless people bring the, the information to the Board of Supervisors or unless the Board of Supervisors is plugged in, there will still be inequities that are not being addressed, such as the example I keep bringing up about the foreclosure. The council, the supervisor did not know about it and we brought it to full attention of everyone. So the person who sits there for District 3 has to be able to plug in and work with all of these groups as well as the community. I've worked on housing projects, transportation projects, and um, community development projects in the unincorporated area. I've worked with the housing department. I served as the chair of Alameda County Public Housing. I've worked with the community development agency, um, the economic development department, and the public works department to deliver services in San Lorenzo and Fair. Um, Fair, Fairview, uh, Castro Valley, um, San, uh, Ashland, and uh, Cherryland, and, and uh, Haywood Acres. So I'm familiar with these areas. And um, as a former city and council second. person, as a community member, um, I'm still now working with them on some other aspects of what's happening in their communities. Time. Thank you so much. Um, and so I actually do have another question from someone who couldn't be here today. Um, and their question for y'all is, um, they would love to hear more about what policies you'll push forward that institutionalize food systems change, food security and food access in the county. Uh, for example, soda tax, uh, junk food tax at the county level. Um, yeah, so Lena, if you could answer that first. So what policies will you push forward that institutionalize food systems change, food security and food, and food access in the county? And 90 seconds still to answer, thank you. I definitely uh, want to expand the all-in program um, because that uh, built in a, a whole uh, system that uh, helps with uh, food recovery, but also uh, making sure that uh, we have a food security that's accessible uh, through mobile units. And I know right now they're even talking about creating this app where uh, people can uh, quickly get access. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, I think, um, funding that comes to these programs that are part of the circular economy, whether it's trying to get job training for, um, formerly incarcerated individuals that will help with the delivery process and also making sure that we uh, distribute food through the clinics and help uh, with the prevention of significant diseases like diabetes that are very prevalent in um, areas that are high in, in with people of color and making sure that we also make better use of the, um, the agricultural uh, lands and the community centers and uh, helping uh, uh, this whole concept of growing your own food and creating this this uh, concept that uh, makes it more accessible Ten seconds. to all uh, the families, like, uh, for example, the one that we have in Ashland uh, with, with the REACH Center and making sure that we have Time. that kind of uh, Time. access. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lena. And uh, Sir Lee? Um, okay. First of all, like you gave the examples of uh, soda tax and, and so forth. Personally, personally, professionally, I hate that we have to legislate how people eat. I just, I just hate that that's what, what we've come to. So I'd rather flip that a little bit and make it easier for people to eat health more healthy. And if that means having coupons, that could, because it's expensive to eat healthy, it's expensive to get fresh fruit and vegetables and, and that shouldn't be. But if that means having coupons that you know we can go to grocers and, and, and get the food, I'd like to make sure, especially from the county seat, that we have, we, we eliminate the food deserts, that even if there's not a big grocery store in a community, that we can work with the planning department and the community development department to create a, a, a hub or a store, take a liquor store and make the liquor store have a produce section. I don't know, something that makes people be able to um, find options because actually the root cause of this bad food is not because we need to do a soda tax. It's be, it goes back to the inequities of racism and redlining and planning, and people have been kicked to a seconds. to a second class by design neighborhood that should not be a second class neighborhood. So we need to lift our neighborhoods. Time. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sarlene. And then uh, next, David, if you could answer this question. Also, I just uh, realized that I skipped you for the previous question about unincorporated communities. So I will follow up with you about that right after we finish this round of questions. Um, so again, if you could answer, what policies will you push forward that will institutionalize food systems change, food security, and food access in the county? Uh well, uh, the issue around a soda tax is, um, so I, I don't know what the time frame is. The, the state has sus had suspended, I don't know if that has expired, a prohibition of, uh, of any uh, attempts to uh, uh, impose uh, taxes on sugar-sweetened be beverages. It was at the state level. It was a deal that was cut through by lobbyists and the Democratic Party. Uh, to uh, shut that down uh, because there was some momentum uh, being established nationally uh, as a public health approach to uh, obesity uh, prevention and other chronic disease prevention. Uh, if, it's, if that uh, prohibition is now out, I think it's worth to discuss the feasibility of, uh, uh, of, uh, of such legislation uh, at the ballot box. Uh, the uh, other issues I think really for the county uh, relate to uh, procurement as well as there are different things that we have in terms of uh, community uh, health clinics. We have schools. There are more schools than there are stores. Uh, I've, I've been in Sa San Lorenzo and blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of houses. In seconds. Uh, I see no sto stores, but I see schools. And, the, the, uh, and schools could very well be a neighborhood distribution center to Hi. our toughest neighborhoods. Thank you so much, David. Okay, and so Rebecca? Thank you. Thank you so much. So sometimes people say that a lot of small fish working together can be bigger than the big fish. And one of the big changes we need in food policy is when county government institutions that make big food orders, they need to stop buying from big corporate producers that use toxins in their products and buy from local producers. And that's why I want to support and expand the food hubs so that many small producers can be brought together to serve the big institutional contracts too, so that everyone gets healthier food and our community gets access to those jobs and that money stays in our community. Our food systems need to be more local, more organic, more healthy, and keep money in the pockets of our community instead of taking it out. 
I was very proud to co-author the soda tax uh, with Annie Campbell Washington and Desley Brooks. The three of us brought it together and we fought against a huge amount of money from the soda industry and I'm their sorry. lies and their bullying and we passed it and we're using that money to fund healthy corner store conversions and we need more of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And now, um, David, if you could answer the question that uh, Juliana asked earlier, which is, what steps would you take to address local concerns about the lack of equity and transparency for the unincorporated communities? Uh, well, I, two things. Uh, I want to work. Uh, I, 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 uh, I want to meet folks uh, from my Eden Voice. Um, I want to uh, understand uh, your experiences. Uh, I want to hear the voices of your membership and your leaders. Uh, and I want to work with you uh, uh, very closely on how you see uh, uh, things in the un unincorporated areas. That is uh, real super critical. Um, that is a must do. Second is that in the oversight function around uh, uh, services to the unincorporated areas, uh, the county board is, uh, should uh, most definitely uh, have an equity framework in seeing how services, county services are being delivered uh, from uh, paving the streets to lighting, uh, to uh, uh, sheriff uh, uh, services, law enforcement, uh, the whole gamut and looking at uh, whether the services are being uh, delivered uh, in an equitable fashion and that we're getting the kinds of results uh, that we need for those uh, that are the least resourced uh, and have uh, the, uh, uh, the least voice and power. Thank you so much, David. So we have one final question before moving on to um, the closing statements. So the final question is from Charles and uh, they're asking, would you support allowing only supervisors of unincorporate, unincorporated areas uh, to make final financial decisions for the area rather than the full board? So again, it is, would you support allowing only supervisors of unincorporated areas to make financial decisions for the area rather than the full board? And whoever feels like they want to answer first can go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm happy to go ahead. Um, so thank you very much. And I wanna say the unincorporated areas have not been getting the level of attention that they deserve. And that includes around the basics like road maintenance and getting rid of blight. It also includes in terms of attention and time and thoughtfulness, like when the county is deciding a budget and really should be looking at the unincorporated piece of the budget for local municipal services separately. And I am prepared to work with you to fight for changes to process, to even to where the meetings are held, to make sure that the unincorporated area gets heard. I think the suggestion that is made uh, comes from a place of wanting to make sure the unincorporated area gets heard. I suspect the county council will say it is illegal and would not allow us to pass that if we introduced it. I would certainly be willing to have that conversation. But even if that option isn't allowed, that doesn't mean we stop there. I would absolutely be dedicated to fighting to make sure the needs of the unincorporated area are fully heard. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'll, I'll take it next. I think that the representatives of the unincorporated area would be the best to make the recommendations for how the money and the finances are, are allocated, spent, or sought, maybe, you know, seeking funds. Um, and I think that they should take the lead in um, presenting the cases for the funds with community support. Again, uh, my, my thing, my concept, my philosophy on leadership is followership. So I can only lead if there's a following. And so I need the, the members of the unincorporated community to be behind something. And that makes it all the more persuasive. 
I don't, as, as uh, Rebecca said, I don't think in this, in this moment, it would be legal for the final expenditure on, on a budget item to be up to just one or two people. However, there are some discretionary funds that of course could be used and maybe there could be some changes to where and how the discussion, discretionary form funds come from, how they're pulled. So maybe if there's something about illegal dumping that's a big, and blight, that's a big problem, which it is, that's a big problem in the unincorporated area, then maybe there's a special Ten fund seconds. that's allocated from public works that's at the control of the community and the board of supervisors, the two members that represent the unincorporated Time. area. Thank you, Celine. I can go next. Um, so when I was uh, on the Alameda County Planning Commission, I um, was part of a number of hearings in the unincorporated areas uh, and, and they ranged uh, from a broad array of issues. Uh, usually it's like a, a street lamp needs to be fixed, roads uh, and traffic circulation is not safe for pedestrians or sidewalks are needed or, or basically uh, uh, we want more stores, we want a Trader Joe's in our area, or, or things along those lines. I think it's very important to make sure that the um, unincorporated area is, uh, is heard. And uh, one of the um, efforts that I had supported uh, was one of the members in the unincorporated area pushed to have the formation of the municipal advisory councils um, because they can uh, directly uh, make sure there's uh, a voice for the unincorporated communities. Uh, the awkwardness of having a, a board of supervisors that represent a specific unincorporated area uh, make the decision on the budgeting uh, makes it seem very undemocratic. For example, like in there's unincorporated agricultural lands out in uh, the Livermore area, and, and there's only one supervisor that represents that area. So having that person make the decision solely uh, would be uh, difficult. So I think it has to be a democratic process at this point. Okay. Thank you, Lena. And then lastly, David? Uh, the, the straight answer is uh, no, I don't support that. Uh, it's the responsibility of the entire board uh, to take care of business in the unincorporated area. It is a basic function and a basic responsibility of the County Board of Supervisors and of county government. Uh, and so if that requires uh, raising up the tension uh, among uh, the, the five board, uh, board of Supervisors or with the county administrator, uh, then the tension needs to be raised. Uh, and so in, in, I believe what I interpreted was the spirit of what Rebecca said is that uh, Rebecca will be a champion for the unincorporated areas uh, and I will too. Uh, I, I think that that is the, uh, the uh, principal approach uh, for a single uh, supervisor uh, to take uh, to get uh, better services for the unincorporated. Thank you so much, David. So now we are going to move to closing statements. Um, again, you will all have 90 seconds to say your closing statements. Um, I'd like to remind us all again to uh, speak slowly. And um, yeah, first up we have Lena Tam. Thank you very much for hosting this forum. I want to work with all of you to be your voice on the Board of Supervisors. I bring the depth and the breadth of experience in leadership skills to the board, having served on the Alameda City Council, the Alameda Healthcare District Board, and the Alameda County Planning Commission. I continue to be an advocate for policies that protect our rights, uh, working with the League of Women Voters, the Asian Pacific Democratic Caucus, and helping young people, promoting open space and healthy communities through things like our Parks Foundation and Hospital Foundation Boards. In these roles, I've advocated for projects like pedestrian safety, housing, and condemning hate crimes. I want to work with all of you to elevate the legacy of the late Wilma Chan to new heights, particularly in improving access to county safety net service. I'm honored to have the support of community leaders and groups like the Alameda Contra Costa Medical Association, Housing Advocates, Controller Betty Yee, 
Treasurer Fiona Ma, Supervisor Dave Brown and Dave Halbert, former Supervisor Alice Lightbaker, County Assessor Fong Law, Auditor Melissa Wilkes and Mayors Marilyn Ashcraft and Libby Schaff and over 60 community leaders that are listed on my website at linatam.com. I would be very honored to earn your vote in advocating for the needs of our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, Serlene, we'd love to hear your closing statement. Thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity and your attention to listening to all of us and listening especially to me. And um, I wanted to say I am the candidate that brings state legislative uh, uh, experience as I worked for the Speaker of the Assembly. I um, have worked in local government. I've worked for the city of Oakland uh, and, and I've worked uh, as an elected official with the city of San Leandro along with my consulting endeavors now. So in my work, I work at the intersection of housing, transportation, community development, and environmental justice to try, try to make sure that our communities are communities, as I say about my desire with San Leandro, are communities that we want to live in, not that we have to live in, and are communities that present us with a quality of life. I'm running to be that policymaker who opens doors and makes opportunities possible for everyone, who breaks through the bureaucracy, I work equity first every day, not a buzzword, been doing it since I've been working. I haven't been doing it since 2016 or 2020. It be, leads to good policy, collaborative decision-making. And so I've been bringing people to the table all along. Um, food and housing, which was our theme tonight, is everything. It's like I said it's earlier, like food, food security and housing security could come could cure so many of our ills. So I hope to work with Time. you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serlene. Um, and David, for your closing statement. Uh, thank you very much uh, again for this opportunity to, to meet everyone and to uh, an opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas. Uh, I am uh, putting into the chat uh, my uh, cell phone number and my email at my personal uh, email address. Uh, if anybody wishes to uh, have further dialogue on the questions uh, that we discussed today, or if you have any questions uh, and opinions yourself uh, separate from that, uh, I'd love to have the conversation. Uh, I hope I didn't look too irritated on the screen. Uh, the 90 seconds was... Uh, a, a little too short. Your questions are great questions. And uh, your questions are things that uh, I feel I deal with every day, day in and day out. They're complex. Uh, and I, I want real solutions. And I want to improve uh, the lives and the quality of life uh, for uh, people uh, in our communities. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, I want to build relationship with you. Uh, and to work together uh, and reach common ground uh, and to uh, move our communities forward. So I invite you to contact me uh, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and then lastly for Rebecca, your closing statement. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. I ask for your vote and I ask to work together to build a stronger and healthier future for our communities. The County Board of Supervisors oversees our hospitals and public health system. We need to invest in community mental health and community health clinics, provide job training in healthcare and food industry and other essential workers. We need to strengthen the food hub that has been opened and work to open food hubs throughout the county and understand that it isn't only in one area. Food is public health and that needs to be everywhere. We need to protect and strengthen Head Start and make sure everyone has access to childcare. And we need to protect tenants from displacement and build more affordable housing, including by using public land. I'd love to work with you to do these things. I'm honored to be endorsed by the Democratic Party, Our Revolution, Oakland Rising Action, Planned Parenthood, the Labor Council, the California Nurses Association, our firefighters, 
the San Leandro Democratic Club, Ten Alameda seconds. Progressives, and many more. And I'd be honored to have your vote and to serve you as supervisor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca and David and Serlene and Lena. It was really great to hear from all of you and uh, really appreciate you all trying to cram so much nuance into 90 seconds. Um, you know, it was very, it was a challenging ask and our questions were really in depth. So thank you for stepping up to that challenge. Um, and thank you again to everyone else who, uh, um, who was able to come to this forum and to everyone who made this event possible. Uh, election day for District 3 is, and other races isn't officially until June 7th, but early voting has already begun. So all registered voters should have received or will be receiving a ballot in the mail. Once you receive your ballot, you can fill it out, sign it, and put it back in the mail, no postage necessary. Uh, you can also return your ballot to a Dropbox or vote in person starting at least four days before the June 7th uh, election day. Uh, information on where to vote in person or where to locate a ballot drop box will be provided in the chat. And finally, a message from East Bay Housing Organizations. May is Affordable Housing Month and this forum is a part of a series of events where we recognize the importance of affordable housing. And the chat box will be sharing information on how you can join EBHO or East Bay Housing Organizations for even more informative events during this month. Um, and they'll also share a link to our study room to learn more about housing resources, policy information, and profiles of residents and properties. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone who joined and to all the participants who submitted questions. Uh, we will share questions um, with, if there are any additional questions, we'll share them with the candidates. And if they're willing to answer them, we'll share their answers as well. And we will also be sharing a recording of the event. So you should be getting that in your inbox at some point soon. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank and you. remember to vote. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.